Well, like I said, we're looking at this different aspect of, of Advent. We're looking at peace, specifically the Prince of Peace, another name of Jesus through all the different names that we know from Scripture. And we're going to be looking at the aspect of, of the perspective of Mary. Again, last week we looked at the perspective of Joseph. This week we looked at the perspective of Mary. And so we give a little bit of insight within the background of, of who she was. We know that she didn't have a whole lot. We know that she was very young. Many believe between 13 to 14 years old. Um, she had different characteristics that, according to the world, would make her almost unusable for God. But that's exactly what God does. He takes those things that what we would imagine to be unusable and makes them usable. We know that she was most likely illiterate. She herself had very little knowledge of the scriptures and what she did know. She, she understood from what she heard at the synagogues and what she had memorized possibly as a child. She was very poor. She never traveled many miles away from home. She worked very hard for her family. But God favored her. God favored, favored Mary. This morning, again, we're looking at chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, and our theme is this this morning, that peace came when the greatest news ever proclaimed to the humblest of servants. It's important that we see the aspect of peace coming about to the humblest of servants and, and understanding that peace and humility kind of go hand in hand, specifically here. But as we see, as we, if you were to continue reading on past with what we have already seen this morning, you, you'll see that Mary sings a song, and she writes this beautiful song as she realizes how grateful she has been visited by this, this angel. And the news that she had, it completely transformed her heart. It transformed who she was, and she became the shelter of the Almighty recognizing that here she is being sheltered by the Almighty as well, taken care of. So as we see these different aspects, how could I personally respond to Christmas? May that be our question this morning. How are we going to respond to Christmas? Mary responded with a song. As she was the first one who received the message of the gospel, and as she heard it, she received it with a courageous faith and a peaceful surrender. It's amazing as we look to what we can learn from a teenage girl at this point in her life. It can be said that many historians believe that she might very well have been the very first Christian. She heard the gospel, and she responded. She responded with faith, which gave her peace. Mary was ultimately the first person who heard the gospel message. Mary realized that Christmas really was the ongoing story of salvation. You see, Mary was there for all of it. Think about it. She was there at his birth. She watched his life, his death, and his resurrection. She saw salvation firsthand, and it brought about peace. In fact, it brought the Prince of Peace. We've heard the salvation is said as this, that Jesus was born miraculously, lived his life perfectly, so that he could die horrifically, ultimately to rise triumphantly, so that we could live eternally with him. Salvation brings with peace, and that is all throughout this Advent season as we look at the five different ways that we see Christ's life. Last week we looked at hope. This week we look at peace. Next week we're going to look at joy. Christmas Eve we're going to look at it from the aspect of love, and even the day after Christmas where we get to have, we get to have church as well, we look at it from the aspect of light what we're called to respond to. But Mary's peace is a model for those who experience the birth of the Savior in their lives. So our first thing that we're looking at is we dive into the first four verses, verses 26 to 29, we see this, that, that Mary had peace as she pondered God's Word. 
Now, we receive the first response we see is we see Gabriel makes an appearance. Now, if we remember just six months ago, right? Not here physically, but within Scripture, six months before that, that Gabriel had shown himself to Zechariah. Right? And, and told Zechariah that your wife will be bearing a son even in her old age. But if you remember, because Zechariah doubted because of her old age, that his response was that he would become mute and would be speechless. But one thing that we see as he, Gabriel, arrives with Mary, it's reasonably believed that his appearance, appearance wasn't as awesome as it was to Zechariah. Why? Well, if he appeared like he did to Zechariah, most likely he would have, she would have been frightened out of her senses as well. But she indeed had to know that he was an angel. So she listened closely to his words. I even imagine, and this is just my creative brain thinking, that maybe he was hovering a little bit just to show who he was, right? Just to show, show, his, show his abilities, right? But knowing Mary was young, she was very poor, she didn't have a whole lot, but Gabriel's reading was, it was necessary. What he had to say was necessary. And within his greeting, it meant full of grace, when, when he said in verse 28, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. He is saying the greeting that here I am and here you are full of grace. Now, many of us know that, uh, that the Catholic Church has, has taken Mary and, and, and elevated her to a place that she shouldn't be. But Gabriel did share that, that she was favored by God. But it's important that we know why and what came about when he said that God favors you. There's two declarations that come about because of that. The first declaration is that Mary was the recipient of divine favor. It means that when it said God favors you, she got to receive that God favored her. Now, when you look at her life, she comes from humble circumstances. She comes from a, a very humble heart. And with her circumstances and her heart, it made her an ideal recipient for God's favor. The second declaration that comes about, it says Mary was told that the Lord was with her. This shows us a dynamic presence and power of God. The very powerful statement all throughout the Old Testament is a blessing to come and to have the presence of God with you. Now, here, this is something that you and I, if we have been a follower of Jesus Christ for a long time, we know that we have received the Holy Spirit and that the presence of God is with us. Before the Holy Spirit came, in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit came to and fro. It would come to and then it would depart. So what a blessing to know that the presence of God was with her. So when he says, the, you have been favored, the Lord is with you, it is something very, very special. And then Mary's response reveals another blessed part of her heart. As she responds in verse 29, she saw that she was, she was greatly troubled at what was being said as she tried to understand what this greeting meant. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was 13 years old, I was not pondering words. They were going in one ear and out the other. <laughs> But Mary was able to ponder those words. The literal sense, as we read what this is, she's pondering the meaning. It means that no matter what Gabriel looked like or what came about with his words, upon this, she meditated on this to try to understand what it meant. And it really throws a, a remarkable picture of what was taking place in this young, inexperienced, yet able-bodied person as she's reflecting and meditating on these words. She was full of of grace. She thought about what the message meant to her, and then the next part. It's almost like the frontal lobe of this 13-year-old had developed instantaneously. Because not only did she think about what the words meant, she also thought about what it would require of her. That's special. 
That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen to a 43-year-old man, much less a 13-year-old girl. Mary's example has incredible practical relevance here. As, as we see the, this experience of the birth of the Savior in their lives, those who ponder God's words, we look at the words of Psalm chapter 119, verse 78, as it says this, May the arrogant be put to shame for knowing me without cause, but I will meditate on your precepts. It's the calling of what we are to respond to in meditating on his words, pondering what comes about when the peace of Christ, as he promises to be that, to give with his presence that is with us. You see, at Christmas time, when we consider these chapters and with what's taken place, as we understand the f- totality of what's taken place is the Prince of Peace being born unto us. I don't know about you, but I get lost sometimes with the rigorous of Christmas. I think about even what's going on in my own particular life. We talked about this this morning in Sunday school class. Are we being still and remembering what Christ has done? At this very moment, we remember the Prince of Peace was born unto us. Mary did. Mary did. And she had peace because she pondered God's word. That's how we understand with what's taken place during this Christmas season. Secondly, this, we see this, Mary had peace as she understood the miracle of Jesus. Now here we look at verses 30 to 34, and at the very beginning we see the angel says, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. All right, so twice he mentions that you've been favored by God. But he starts off by saying, don't be afraid. Again, we're going to see that all throughout Scripture when an angel appears to a human being. Don't be afraid. Why? Because it's probably frightening. It's probably frightening. But what we see here is, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. So she was told that she's going to have a baby boy, and she was commanded to name him Jesus This is nothing more than a lightning bolt directly to her heart. Most believe that she did not fully understand at this point. And I can only imagine, I don't think I would understand at that point either. The beginning of verse 32, it says, He will be great and called the Son of the Most High. (laughs) Again, staggering words as we pause, as we look through what what is being said. Uh, The child that she will have in her womb is God's son. I can't fathom it. I can't imagine. I can't even imagine if if Jesus himself were sitting on the front row and, and, and here we are speaking, here we are living life, and here he is in the presence. I can't even imagine that. I know he is through the Spirit, but I understand in human form, he's there, he's present, he's with them. The second part of verse 32 and 33 says, And the Lord God will give you the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary heard these words as she looked, Then now she's going to become the mother of the long-awaited Messiah, as she had been studying at the synagogue, as she understood, and she finally might have gotten the idea at this moment. She was the one that God was going to use to bring about the Davidic covenant to fruition. I can't imagine all that was going on in her head and in her heart. But Mary's response, humble, as she reflected on what she was told and as she understood Then she asked the most logical of questions. How do we know that it probably stuck with her at that moment is her next question. How can this be? For I am a virgin. Now, it doesn't mean that she disbelieved with what was taking place. No. 
all it shows is she's simply asking, give me the biological way that this is going to take place. How? How? If you remember in the 80s, the, the sitcom Different Strokes, we said, what you talking about, Willis? That's the type of response that she's given. What are you talking about? But Mary had peace. Her question was a life-giving question, and it requires an examination of the significance with what Christ was going to do in his atoning work on the cross and cleansing benefits that come because of the faith. You see, the mysteries of the new birth, right? The mysteries of when you and I receive Jesus Christ in our hearts and our lives, we become a new creation, the, the Scripture speaks of. We can't define that or, or understand that fully. Nor did she understand how she was going to give birth and she's never had sex. Point blank. How is this going to be? The mysteries that come about. But understanding is what she came to as she heard the words of the angel. And Mary had peace as she understood the miracle of Jesus. The third thing we see here is that Mary had peace as she had faith in God's will. Verses 35 to 38, it says, The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now what's interesting, you and I, we think, all right, well, how did the Holy Spirit do this? How, did, how could this be because she was a virgin? Now, I want us to, we'll get to dive into the language of what's taking place here. Within, when he says the word, the, the one you have to understand is what the word overshadowed means. And so the overshadowed is, is not re, does not re, mean, uh, re, say anything that has to do with like a sexual union or any has no sexual overtones in it whatsoever. But the word within the language of odor, overshadow gives us a proper understanding because it is used in the Hebrew Old Testament to describe God's presence in the sanctuary. It's when he came to be a part of the Holy of Holies. And it's the same word and overtone that's come about when it's talking about Mary conceiving. And it's the same word it's used in the New Testament when it talks about when the transfiguration took place, where the cloud of glory overshadowed the Lord and his apostles. It's the same language with what's taking place. All right, so you're asking, what does that mean? Well, we get to see the first thing that Mary had peace to, as she had faith in God's will. We see in verses 35 and 36, we see the presence of God. We see the presence of God. That's what the overshadowing means. And so may we just hold tight to what this says is we will have peace when we recognize the presence of God in our lives, just as Mary did. Mary understood the awesome significance of what she had heard. And that is one of the things that held her so faithful during the tumultuous months in years that followed. You think, the tumultuous months, what truly took place? Well, remember that when she went back home, she was pregnant, and she hadn't been with Joseph yet. They were not living together yet. We talked about that last week. Yet she's pregnant. So she's viewed as, as an outcast. But the presence of God, through that, she had peace. That's powerful. Those who have experienced the birth of Christ and understand what has taken place in our lives as we are regenerated to become more like Him, in the process of sanctification, the presence of God is the miracle of life-giving work as the Holy Spirit has given us and bestows upon us the presence, His own presence in our lives. That is one of the wonders of Christ offers each of us new life from above, something that we, we can't do by ourselves, something that we need to know for sure. 
And so we understand that she, she understood all this at this moment. But how gracious of God to even give her a sign. So Gabriel's mission was now complete as he shares this news with her. He also says, here's your sign. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. So she's saying, your cousin is pregnant. She's old, but she's pregnant. She was considered by doctors to be barren. She's pregnant. So not only is the miracle going to take place in your own life, but now you have the blessing of being able to spend some time with Elizabeth. And if you haven't seen, a, there's a, a movie came out in 2006 called A Nativity Story. It gives a really good picture of what, what was happened after Mary was, was, was with child and she went to go live with Elizabeth for a few months. And, and the camaraderie that Mary and Elizabeth have together brings her security. As here she is, pregnant. Joseph, at this point, you know, had just said, oh, yeah, I, I, I believe you. Uh, I'm not going to divorce you, but I do believe you now. And, and now here she is. She gets to go and visit Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth comes in, she gets to talk about, hey, the angel told me about what's happening in you. And what a blessing for you to be able to bring about the Son of God. I'm with child too. And the moment you came into my presence, my womb leapt. That's powerful. But that's what the presence of God does in our lives. It brings about something that we can't explain. Something that, that we know ourselves we cannot do. Elizabeth was, was, was pregnant, yet she was called barren. This amazing news that came about really brought Mary some comfort. And was an example of what the presence of God does in her own life. And then verses 37 and 38, we see what the truth is, right? For nothing is impossible with God. I must say that again. For nothing is impossible with God. I don't know, maybe in your own life you're thinking, we talked about this in Sunday school this morning as well, that you think about certain loved ones that have been shared the gospel multiple times and, and they have not received the good news of Jesus Christ. And we think, oh, well, they're probably just never going to. Nothing's impossible with God. Maybe if you, you're experienced in your own life, you're thinking that, that in your heart of hearts, you're, you've experienced pain and hurt, and, and you think, oh, how, how am I going to get through this? Nothing is impossible with God. No matter where we are, no matter what it is, nothing is impossible with God. But Gabriel's final words literally mean this. This blew my mind. For not impossible will be every word with God. That's what the literal meaning is. For not impossible will be every word with God. When we see something as nothing is impossible with God, we think, oh, well, you can move mountains if I have the faith of a mustard seed. And we think about like our little aspect of what we have, right? For not impossible will be every word word with God. The same language is used when Sarah becomes pregnant with Isaac. The very same language. God would fulfill his word. Nothing is too hard for God. It's as simple as that. Mary knew that her story would be doubted. And we read about that even last week with Joseph. But Mary even knew that the death penalty would be prescribed for her adultery if Joseph claimed that it was. She could be put to death. The New Testament history records that Jesus' enemies went on to even imply that Jesus himself was illegitimate. That he came about in the wrong way. 
But in the light of all that was going on, all of what was transpiring in Mary's heart and Mary's thoughts, her response was eternally focused. Because she responds like this. Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. When was the last time you responded to God like that? God, no matter what it takes, no matter what my circumstances, no matter what my ailments, no matter what my family life, no matter what my work history, no matter my heart's attitude, no matter what it is, I'm your servant. I'm going to do with what you desire for me. No matter what the cost, I am your servant. I will do your will. May it be to me according to your word. Amen. The moment she said that, the angel left. It's like, I got it. I got it. And she held tight to those words. That became her mantra. That became her, her gusto by every step she took from that moment on. Mary could have said, yeah, that's not going to happen. Mary's out. Nope. I don't want anything to do with this. She could have responded that way. But if we look at the history of Mary's life, she had a habit of submitting to God. And she becomes a real incredible example of belief and discipleship for you and for me. As we look at the faith that she had, as she trusted the words of God, as she was willing to do whatever it takes, her obedience made her the mother and the disciple of Jesus. That peace that comes from the Holy Spirit is what she relied on. I was just thinking as we were looking in John chapter 15 this morning in Sunday school and we we're looking at in John 15 where it talks about I am the vine, you are the branches, those who remain in me and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. It's this picture of, I, I love the one of the original words it, call, it says to abide. It means to, to be with, right? And I, I love the picture of even the sound of the word abide, rely. I just felt is the moment that I heard abide the, is the moment I heard rely. And I think as, as followers of Jesus, we're called to rely upon God. And it's, it brings about the fruit that God desires in us. The very fruit that Mary had when she eternally focused on the words that were said and she responds, I am a servant of the Lord. May it be to me as you have said. She claimed to be a servant. Bringing about words of life that Jesus would use on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. I can only imagine as Jesus is using these words, he's picturing his mom. Because that's what his mom did. Your kingdom come, your will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven. That's what brings about this theme. As we're looking about here comes heaven, it's may your kingdom come, may your will be done. It's submitting like Mary. And it's almost as if it is a must for a follower of Jesus. We cannot experience Christ in his ongoing power without totally surrendering ourselves to him. Mary's peace is a powerful reminder to, in such a beautiful season, a season that we celebrate the Savior's birth. And so it gives us our challenge this morning. If Christ is in us so that we are God's children, then Mary's heart is our model of discipleship. The picture that she led her life. I'm not here to raise up Mary. I'm just saying that she was a great example for you and I. And she relied upon the Spirit just like you and I should. And she heard God's Word and she obeyed them just like you and I should. It's the very picture of someone who obeyed and we are called to obey. Why? Because she understood that the peace that comes, that surpasses all understanding, is the peace that only God can give. And she relied upon the Prince of Peace. 
We must cultivate in our hearts a humble heart and an ongoing poverty of spirit that is only, not only open to God's grace, but desperately desires it and longs for it. When you think about God's grace, we, we think of something that has been given to us that we hold on to that, that makes us right in God's eyes. When's the last time you longed for that grace? Because you didn't recognize it in your own life at maybe a certain time or moment. Well, our application is this, is, is to believe in your heart. To believe in your heart. If today you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, may today be the day of your salvation. As you recognize that He came to do what He said He was going to do, He is who He says that He is. And when He came, He lived a perfect life so that He could die and atone for our sins, which means it means to make right between you and I and the Creator of the universe. When we believe that in our hearts, recognize that we need forgiveness in our lives and our desire is to repent, meaning that we turn from our wrong way and walk in the light of His right way. Are we going to sin after that? Most certainly. But every time, may it, may, it, may it eat away at our souls when we sin so that we desire to be right with God, longing for His grace that He has given to us, both you and myself. There's no other way unto heaven but through Him. And secondly, is may we submit in our hearts as well. Only the peace of God and surrender and trust causes us to submit to Him as Mary did. May her words be our mantra. I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me as you have said. Remember, Jesus was born miraculously. Obviously, He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life so that he ultimately would die horrifically, ultimately to rise triumphantly so that we could live eternally with him. We will arise, he will arise to shepherd the flock in his own strength and in the grace and truth and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And he would rise to be his people's peace. The Prince of Peace. Let's pray together.